Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome everyone to this Young Rail Professionals webinar event on disrupting disruption, improving the customer experience. So I'd like to welcome you all uh, to this event. Um, yes, this event was a bit, supposed to be a little bit earlier in the year, but it, um, it did get a bit disrupted. So um, we're here now. Um, so if it's your first time here at the Young Rail Professionals event, um, a little bit about us. Um, so we are the Young Rail Professionals, and our mission is to promote, inspire, and develop the next generation of railway talent. So that's for those already in the rail industry. Um, so that's a, a platform for people that are currently at the beginning of their careers to link with other like-minded people, get to know people across the industry, um, and to uh, connect, network, share ideas. This is the the, uh, the great platform that we've got here to to do that. So if you haven't joined, then get on the website and sign up as a member. It's completely free. It costs zero pounds, um, and it's a great resource to have to get to know people in the industry. The industry is a big industry. It covers a huge area across the whole of Britain. So it's a great way of doing that. The other aspect of uh, YRP is a way of connecting uh, with people outside the industry to show off how good it is. We know how good it is, but what about other people? So to get people involved um, who are job seekers, uh, university students, school students, we do a lot of uh, um, outreach work such as Interrail and STEM to uh, make the rail industry as an attractive place to be and work. We know how diverse and interesting and uh, innovative the rail industry is, so we just need to kind of show, show that off, and that's what uh, YRP does as well. Um, so what we're going to do now is to, uh, we're going to give you the background to um, the disrupting disruption event idea. So just give a bit of a background. So first of all, I'm going to cast your minds back, um, everyone, to the heady days of February of this year when people were commuting and crowd onto trains and all that kind of thing. Um, so we've got here some some angry tweets from people. Uh, these angry tweets are from people who are crowded on trains. And one of the, one of the key themes, if you look across the tweets that I extracted here, uh, is about the lack of information. So when delays happen, things go wrong, getting information out to customers has been really important because it's a key running theme. Now, I'm not digging out Great Northern or Govia Thames Inc. Railway here. These are just a few tweets from a few days in February. Um, I mean, noting as well how, how important this used to be when we were all commuting. I mean, if you look here, 2020 to date, to be human is to suffer. Um, that really is put into context these days. But it's not just Great Northern. Um, it's also uh, happening in the great north of our country with Transplant Express. But information is definitely a key theme here. Um, and also from the allies of the rail industry as well. We've got uh, Dr. David Turner, uh, who's a uh, who's lecturer in railway studies, showing a kind of internal inside look at you know when things go wrong and things are not optimal for people that are inside the industry who know how it works reflecting on how these things can not be so optimal when things go wrong about in information so it's coming from all, all sides that's not to say the industry isn't, uh, aren't doing things um here's a story from rail magazine greater anglia putting in customer action teams um to deal with events and disruption Network Rail on Twitter here explaining a, a points failure at Moorgate Station and putting it into simple terms so people can understand. But what this overall means is that the industry can score these kind of own goals with, with customers. And basically, it's a messy picture, excusing the uh, kind of visual, literal metaphor. Um, so, Southwestern Rail, we've got an initiative here where you've got uh, paramedics at Clapton Junction. They'll pull people off a train, give them the treatment they need, keep the trains moving. And there are tech companies that are looking at giving, uh, putting money into disruption apps to give real time information so that there's a lot of information there's a lot of data and there's a lot of things going on so it is a messy picture uh, a difficult picture across the industry but um how do we how do we change this how do we improve the customer experience well that's exactly why i've got an amazing panel this evening for you who are going to look at this from different perspectives from the train operators companies from frontline staff in terms of open data and amazing tools and uh, a whole industry perspective so the uh, panel we've got for you tonight uh, a wonderful group of people here from uh, leading in the industry uh, we've got Suzanne Donnelly from London Northeastern Railway uh, Nathaniel Owen um, YRP London committee member and also working as stations manager at GTR Govia Thames Inc Railway We've got Blake Cracknell, now train manager at Eurostar. We've got Tom Cairns, who is founder of the Real-Time Trains. If you haven't heard of Real-Time Trains, well, ooh, you're in for a treat. It's a fantastic tool. And we're delighted today, we've got Richard Clinic, head of news at Rail Magazine, uh, one of the leading uh, industry publications, who's going to give a uh, wonderful input on, on what's going on across the railway sector and drawing all these thoughts and themes together. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Suzanne. So if you can get your, um, if you can get your mic uh, on and I'm going Hello? to do the sharing thing. There we go, Suzanne. So um, over to yeah. you, Suzanne, for your for your part, and I'm going to disappear. 
Thank you very much, Simon. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, great to have the opportunity to, to chat to you this evening. I'm only going to take a small amount of time and have a very kind of high level run through um, some perspectives from LNER on, on how we manage disruption and how we're disrupting disruption. So I thought a good place to start um, would be our purpose. And this is something that we crafted as a business with over 2000 colleagues um, at the outset of LNER. And that is that we put a heart into everyone's journey. And that really is a bit of a context backdrop for this discussion because, you know, disruption is inev inevitable in an operational railway to a certain degree, but thinking about it from the customer perspective is really what guides us. And why is managing disruption well so important for us as a long distance business? Primarily because we operate in such a busy, competitive and discretionary market. We compete against planes, cars, other train operators, and we have a massive amount of discretionary travel. In fact, 97% of our um, revenue comes from discretionary trips and only 3% from the more daily, typical commuting travellers. Um, so it's really important that, that we give customers a good experience in times are good, but also when times are bad and look after them. And we also know from our um, regular advocacy surveys, um, NAS, the advocacy survey, that some of the key drivers of satisfaction and clearly being kept informed on trains and in stations and having availability of train staff is fundamental to that. So that has been a big area of focus for us. So if you wind the clock back a couple of years, you know, we knew we had a problem statement. We knew we had lots of, um, you know, customer complaints, customer dissatisfaction with, with lots of different areas about how we were managing disruption. And we also gathered a lot of colleague feedback as well in terms of what was working and what wasn't working on the ground. And a result of all of that, we kind of had this real call to action and a rally cry. And that was that disruption will be our finest hour. And actually when things are really bad, we really, really step up and look after the customer and put the customer first and, and support our colleagues and, um, and kind of nail the basics and just get that comfort and that peace of mind that people need when they're traveling. So they'll come back to us again. So what does great look like during disruption? Um, very sort of simple statements, but hopefully they'll resonate with you giving empathetic and personable responses, um, we find this is really important. Um, clear, relevant information, consistent, and equipping our people to make sure that they're safe and confident to do the right thing to get our customers where they need to be. And finally, but, but very importantly, everyone coming together as one team. Um, this is not something that we can solve alone as an individual department or talk. This is something that requires a great deal of cross-functional collaboration and cross-industry collaboration um, to, really, to really see some big improvements in. So one area that we've invested heavily in and continue to do so because we think it's so important to help move us forward in this space is around digital transformation. And I think we've all become in the last couple of months completely used to teams and, and remote working and all of that. But, but last year, what we did was we, we moved quite rapidly to adopt this kind of more virtual team working, particularly in on-call frameworks and processes. And also when we were um, mustering our staff and our colleagues around a certain disruptive event, we moved to Teams chats, team messages, um, Teams channels, all of that. And that's really quite simple, but been really, really effective in terms of getting much, much faster response to incidents, um, creating really direct and quick conversations between the right members of the, of the business to, to make decisions. And, and it's been really, really helpful. Um, we've also invested in LNER Assistant, which is a piece of digital, it's a digital service effectively for anybody who books directly with us that gives them personalized journey information. Um, and the right information at different stages of their journey. 
So that could be in advance of travel, you know, information about um, weather, etc. And also as they're coming to the station, information if there is a change to their departure time or their platform number, um, etc or a cancellation, making sure that they're equipped with that information in real time and that is pushed out to them via the channel that they choose. That could be Facebook Messenger or a text um, or a mobile push. Um, and it's not just about disruption, that the principle of the LNER assistant and that digital support for customers, we really see is going through the entire end-to-end -end customer experience um, in good times and in bad. So we could talk to you a lot about LNR system, but the, in, the, in the kind of limit of time we've got, I just wanted to demonstrate that we've seen a really marked improvement in terms of how, um, how the experience is for those customers when, when they're on disrupted services. Um, net advocacy score or net promoter score, as some of you may know it, um, and as you'd expect, is negative for disrupted services, but we've seen a massive 45 point difference between the people that are actually receiving and using these alerts versus those that aren't. So moving on then from digital, um, people is absolutely a massive part um, in supporting our customers during disruption. And we've done quite a few things, but I just want to highlight a couple. Um, as you see, there's a picture of red jackets here and, and visibility is just something that's so simple but often overlooked and actually by having our people out in their visible red jackets helping whether it's station staff on train staff or managers that just all pitch in to help on the day as things emerge um, it's really helpful for customers to be able to see and find people just to have that direct one-to-one -one conversation and we've seen a lot of positive feedback in terms of um, customer response We've also worked as one team, as I mentioned, and if, if you take, for example, York, whenever there's major disruption, like in Storm Kira or um, Dennis earlier in the year, it's not just LNER out in the concourse helping, it's a combination of LNER, Network Rail, TransPennine colleagues, everybody comes together and does what's right for the customer. So that customer action team is, is proving a really beneficial move. And the last part is about education and expectations. Um, we've done quite a lot of work to kind of set expectations about you know, what, what's expected when, when disruption hits. What's your role if you're a volunteer helping or if you're um, a member of um, staff that's, that's currently rostered on. And, and doing that actually from the outset when people join the company, even from their induction almost on day one, making it very clear that that you know, we're here to look after customers and we're here to keep people moving um, and how they can do that. And some other initiatives just to touch on um, to help enable the better experience is things like boarding controls. And again, during storms and, and periods of time where we've got massive crowds to manage, implementing boarding controls at stations has been very effective to kind of manage the demand, manage um, a much more safe and secure operation and, and give people a bit more reassurance that they're being, um, that they can access whatever services are running in a much more organised fashion, as opposed to a scrum, which can sometimes happen. And, um, and we also like to kind of try and plan in advance, you, you know, where we do know that disruption is likely to hit for example, during the storms earlier in the year, actually doing that thinking ahead and working with industry colleagues, um, alerting customers to, well, what will we be doing? What timetable should we be operating? How do we get people to change their, their, their plans, et cetera, in advance to minimize the issues on the day? Um, and also supporting, uh, giving up passengers the option to support through CAM um, in terms of delay repay is another thing that we've introduced. So a whole lot of things. Um, but is it working? And I think the short answer is yes, because year on year we've seen a 10 point increase in how we've dealt with delays as measured by the National Rail Passenger Survey, um, which is quite a substantial increase. And um, when most other operators are actually going backwards or, or holding level, um, that's quite a significant move. But obviously loads of room for, for further improvement. And the final thing I wanted to touch on was that disruption can take many forms 
Um, but one that we haven't really touched on here is, is about things that arise from the fact that we've got a very open system and, and the fair system effectively enables people to just keep turning up to trains. So actually, this is an area where I think we can really challenge convention and find different ways of um, creating a flexible walk-up railway environment, but in a much more controlled manner that helps us to reduce disruption. And also being able to talk to all the customers on our trains and not just those that we know that book directly with us. Let's, let's um, find a way to be able to communicate in real time and to give all our customers the best possible experience. So that was a very, very quick run through. Um, a few kind of closing thoughts. There's a lot of things that we do, the what that we do, but I think really the how is important. And the how, you know, we, we've taken laser focus. We've really, really focused on, on tackling disruption and, and the program of disruptions our finest are has been right across the business. Collaboration has been key, working with other industry partners, other um, operators, um, Network Rail, and also teams right across the business. And finally, but most importantly, putting customers at the heart of the decisions that we're making and, and the, the plans that we roll out. And, the, and um, that's, that's where we are. So that's a very quick run through and I'll stop now and hand back to Simon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. That's really, really, uh, really, really interesting to get that talk insight and also to, uh, train operating company insight. Um, stop with the jargon and um, to get an idea of what train operating companies are doing as well. Um, Suzanne, we'll come back to you later for the Q and A, uh, which is at the end. Um, so, if I could, yes, get your uh, uh, offline for there. Um, so, if I could get um, Nathaniel up uh, with your um, microphone and camera ready. Excellent stuff. Uh, by the way, just before we get uh, kick off with Nathaniel, um, if you've got any questions about anything you've seen so far um, from the train operating company initiatives or anything that Suzanne said, or for any of the presenters, at the end we'll have a Q and A. Um, we've got the chat box, the question function. So please get um, get get writing away, pop in your questions, and uh, we'll have a hopefully a good Q and A session at the end with all of our uh, panelists as well. So next panelist is Nathaniel. So I'm going to hand over to you um, to kick off from the uh, from the frontline stations perspective. Okay, hopefully I'll be able to move to the next slide now. And uh, here we go. Okay, so I'm just going to talk very briefly um, about disruption on the station. Um, I've taken it basically, off, you know, disruption is such a complicated thing in the railway that I've tried to slim it right down to what you can see in the contents, which is basically three R's react, respond, and resolve. Now, react and respond are quite similar. But let's get into it. So first of all, um, I'm currently station manager of the Peckham Rye area. Before that, I was management trainee. And uh, I've had the joy of working at uh, Britain's busiest station by, pass it by uh, train workings. So it'll be, it, I've had my fair share of disruption. So the first thing basically is react. And um, so we've had a major incident. What do we need? What do we need to know? And what we need to know is what the customer needs to know. And in the information age, there's a million places we can find it and a million places the customer can find it. Um, for us internally, if we want to know where a train is, we've got uh, systems like P2, which is like a map of the signalling, or the customer can look themselves on things like open train times, which is something that, you know, until relatively recently, um, customers relied solely on, uh, you know, the staff at the station to know exactly what's going on. Um, so really, what we need to know is, um, what the nature of the, of the incident is, I guess, and how we can get our customers where they need to go. Um, so the first thing is, once we know what's going on, does the customer already know? Um, I mean, we've all been guilty of it. On uh, the way home, we have a scroll through Twitter, and I'm, I'm sure if you follow rail companies, you'll see regular updates. Um, and to be honest, Twitter has been a brilliant tool for the railway. Um, it has a massive reach, a massive audience, and as well as uh, you know, talking about the, the doom and gloom and disruption, as it were, we can uh, publish good news stories as well about you know initiatives going on in the local area. Um, and in fact, I've experienced it recently where I've been on a train going somewhere, and I've been scrolling through Twitter, and I've seen an incident ahead of me, which they're talking about on Twitter, before I've actually even been affected by it. This can be really good to help our customers 
plan ahead for their journey and maybe make alterations or changes. Um, also, um, you've got apps like uh, real time trains, which obviously you're going to hear from uh, their founder later on, who provide obviously information about real time train running. So you know where your train is, where it's coming from, where it's going. And that, and so if there's a disruption, uh, we can provide customers with a bit of certainty about, you know, OK, my train's here. So I have no need to panic. You know, it's not just vanished. Um, and, you know, so we've got our incident now. Let's get back to that. And we need to tell our customers because there's going to be people out there who they're not too sure what's going on and we need to tell them. And people are going to be stressed out in a major disruption, um, you know, where there's disruption across multiple routes. Um, we need to be clear and concise. Um, we've got tools, obviously, there's messages going out online, but you've also on the station, our staff have got their information from control, through emails, through great apps like Tyrrell Check, which um, some of you may have heard of, um, which I'll touch on a little bit later. Um, and we can give information to customers over the PA and keep it clear and concise. Because if we waffle, people are going to get confused and tempers are going to be high. And basically, that leads on to point number four, really, which is clear understanding with our customers and colleagues. So we need to make sure that every so the person supervising, which uh, could be a team leader, could be a station manager, um, needs to make sure that everybody is providing the same information. Because one of the challenges of having so much open source information and internal information coming out from all different directions is it can get out of date pretty quick. Um, so if we're not all on the same page, um, I as a customer could go to somebody and say, excuse me, what's happening with this train? And they can look on, uh, you know, an app or uh, an information feed, which is slightly, you know, out of date to something that's just been received by email from control to the team leader and tell them one thing when actually something else is the case. So making sure we have clear understanding and can give clear guidance to our customers of how they can make their journey and where they need to go is super important. Okay, so it wouldn't be a railway presentation without some uh, railway acronyms. Now, this is probably one of my favourites, um, the PID acronym. Now, that stands for Passenger Information During Disruption. Um, and I just, whoever invented this was great because uh, it's a four, basically a colour light system where at a glance, so I can get an email from Network Rail um, with all the incidents in the past hour, and at a glance, I know which are going to affect uh, me the most because of the colour. Um, now, obviously, you can see on the screen there a quick explanation of what each means. Um, now, this is this is great because immediately I can prioritise resource in terms of uh, staff on the station who, you know, maybe there's a big disruption on uh, the co coastal services or Brighton mainline services, but Metro's running pretty good. Then maybe I might uh, be looking to have more staff to help our customers on. Uh, the platforms which serve those longer distance trains. Um, then we've got uh, CSL2, which is a customer service level, um, basically, which means uh, that ticket acceptance has been, is gonna be granted pretty much um, from my perspective. And with this, this means that we can start to advise our customers on the alternatives on their journey. So let's take, for example, uh, there's an issue at her screen on the east, which is a place uh, on the East Greenstead line, um, and we need to get our customers where they need to go. Now, luckily for us um, at GTI, we have pretty good relationships with all the other transport providers around, um, so uh, we can get passengers on our service to Oxted, and then we will liaise uh, from control will liaise with the local bus operators to get ticket acceptance in place. Now, it's important that this is relayed clearly to our customers, again, that information, um, and it's important that we understand exactly where our customers can use their ticket if it's for an alternative route. So, because there'll be nothing more frustrating than if we say to our customers, okay, you can go and catch that train, and then they all get to it and they get told, I'm sorry, this is not the case. So, it's important that uh, when, we just, when we're sorting out alternatives for our customers, we know exactly um, you know, what is available. In a major, major disruption or, or a blockage of a main line, for example, with multiple services, um, there may be no alternative. We might not be able to get uh, ticket acceptance with a bus operator, for example. And in this case, we'd be looking at replacement coaches or taxis. 
uh, in the most severe cases. Now, with this comes many complications, and one of these is assisting our vulnerable customers. So, for example, I think from personal experience, I see in a major disruption, obviously, talking pre-COVID times, you'd get probably major overcrowding to come with that. Now, if, if a customer is uh, traveling in a wheelchair, for example, um, you need space for that to go on the train and the train might be a long way, they're sat there, that can be really, really difficult and obviously really traumatic. Same for, you know, people with uh, learning difficulties, etc., they can struggle a lot with uh, getting out of routine if there's a disruption. So it's really important that our staff look out for uh, these kind of these these people who may need extra help, and I know that uh, L and E are they sort of pioneered in the rail industry the sunflower lanyard, which is really great. Um, so because uh, our staff can look out for people who might be in need of a little bit of assistance and make sure that they're comfortable and okay on their journey. Now, for me, if a customer is uh, in a wheelchair and they need to get where they want to go. Uh, and there's a major disruption or delay and there's overcrowding, the easiest way is for them to get in an accessible taxi. So for me, um, it's important that, obviously all our customers are important, but those who need our help most are the ones who we need to look after and prioritize. Okay, so just a quick summary then as we come to a close. Um, as uh, was briefly touched upon in uh, Suzanne's presentation, um, Cut train operators are using Teams, um, and Teams is really great because it allows control or any station and any person who's in the group to send a, a message out. Um, you know, this is what's happening at this station, this incident's unfolding, and this can help us get information much quicker because uh, it's going straight out there from you know the person on the ground, and um, than it would be to find its way you know up into into control through all the systems and out the other side. Um, and so development of this and streamlining of it so that people can find information in different areas um, quicker is definitely something which needs to be uh, explored. And I think as an industry, we are learning and modernizing as we go on. Um, second point is something that I just, it probably it may already exist, but I thought of it um, about when I was thinking what would make my journey experience better when planning my journey. So when I'm still on the platform and I look at national rail inquiries, I can see that uh, my train is two or three minutes late, um, but I can't see if the toilets are out of order as far as I know. I can't see um, if there's uh, no catering services available or if the train's short formed. And these kind of things can influence uh, what the way customers may uh, change their journey plans or habits. So if they see their train short form, they probably know it's going to be busy, so they might get the one early or the one later. So stuff like this, I think, is a, there's a great opportunity for exploring that. Uh, and finally, the last two things is keeping things simple. Customers really, they don't care about the person next to them's train in the grand scheme of things. They care about theirs. And it's important that when we are delivering information on a one-to-one -one basis, um, that we are clear and concise and do not waffle or go into detail about things which are not relevant. And as managers, um, we should be in the thick of it with our people. And to be honest, that's part of the reason I, I love being a station manager, because you get an equal amount of being behind the scenes as to being out on the front on the front line, if you can put it that way. And I think it's so important and such a morale booster and such a support if we are out there with our people and we can support them everywhere we can. That is pretty much it from me. I've accidentally gone to the next one, but basically I want to say thank you to all of the railway workers, you know, Nobody stopped during, you know, the, the times we face and uh, here's to uh, the future of rail. Thank you. Thank you, Nathaniel. Um, yeah, fantastic uh, perspective from the uh, station side. Um, so again, any questions for uh, station staff and that, that kind of uh, that kind of aspect of it, then uh, let us know in the chat if you've got any questions. Um, and yes, uh, we are definitely at YRP going to be echoing the uh, the thank you to every, everything that everyone's doing on the railways to keep the railways going, especially during these extraordinary times. I'm not going to use the other word because everyone says that all the time. Um, next up is Blake Cracknell. Um, who's going to be giving us the perspective, but from a train management uh, on the train perspective. So um, if you could, uh, yes, do exactly that. I'll hand over to you, Blake. I'll just sit here. 
Lovely, thank you, Simon. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, as Simon's just introduced, my, I'm Blake Cracknell. I'm a train manager by trade, um, previously with Great Tranglia, and uh, now, as of January, with Eurostar, which has been quite an interesting change for me. We'll just wait for the uh, slides to catch up. So, number one, number two. So, who am I, or as, as I like to call it, why on earth should you listen to what I'm about to say to you? Um, I started with what was then uh, Abelio Greater Anglia uh, in 2015. I was based at Ipswich at that point. So I covered uh, regional routes around East Anglia and occasionally the mainline services into London Liverpool Street. In 2017, I moved up, up the road to Norwich and uh, I then specialised as a senior conductor. So mainly intercity services through to London um, with a smattering of local trains in between. In 2018, I became an instructor, so I helped at Greater Anglia with uh, training of our conductors, senior conductors, um, right through from when they were in the classroom to when they passed out and beyond. During that time, I realised there was a bit of a gap in what we were doing as an industry, and for a, a good couple of years before I got the go-ahead, I was lobbying for um, personal Twitter accounts for on-train staff. And uh, in late 2018, I got the go ahead to launch um, what was then at Conductor Blake so that I could give specialised information about my train um, to people out on Twitter. So I could use that, for example, if I was on the 654 service from Norwich to London every morning, I could go through that train at the very start of the journey. And as Nathaniel touched on, I could then report how the toilets were looking, whether we got catering on board, whether there's any things that people joining along the line needed to be aware of. Um, and those tweets could either be picked up by the main Great Triangular account, or a lot of my regular commuters over time got to know to check in the morning and, and they could see if I was on their train and I could give them that information. Um, it was really useful that when people, we had our Mark III sets, um, the coaches back then, they were getting a bit long in the tooth and especially in the winter and even in the summer, actually we had problems with the heating, uh, the ventilation, air conditioning system so they could avoid in advance um, those issues. As of uh, January this year, I started with Eurostar as a train manager, um, still in training. Obviously this year has not gone as, uh, as we planned. So unfortunately I've actually been on furlough now for, for longer than I was working, um, working in London with Eurostar. But it's been really interesting actually, because it means I now commute on the trains that I used to work. So I can see both sides of things at the moment. What I'd like to touch on is why people actually get annoyed during disruption. I think it's something that gets ignored a lot of the time. Um, it's just a given to those of us that are railway staff that when things go wrong, people are going to get annoyed. Um, that is true, but there are specific reasons that cause that annoyance that we can work on bit by bit. So uncertainty is a huge one. When is my train going to arrive? Is it going to arrive? Is it going to be diverted? That causes stress. That stress is based on embarrassment. If you're going to a business meeting, are you going to be late? Are you going to look bad? Are you going to be late for work again? That stress is compounded by things such as lack of information, lack of access to staff, and lack of understanding or a lack of an explanation of the issue from us as, as the train operators. And those things can all add up to be quite a perceived lack of empathy. I'll touch on that a bit more in a second. So what did I do and what did I teach my trainees to do at Greater Anglia? Number one rule is honesty. Even if it makes us look really bad, you have to be honest with people. My job on the trains is a bit different to say Nathaniel's on the station. I have a captive audience. They are locked on a train with me. Every morning I would lock a thousand people in a metal tube with me. And it was just me. So I had to make sure they were happy. Otherwise, it was going to get pretty bad for me pretty quickly. Honesty really helps because it builds a trust between myself, the representative of the company and all of the people on the train. One of the big things I used to build that trust was language. I've learned a language in my life. I learned French from scratch. So I pay a lot of attention to tenses. And one thing that really irritates me is the phrase I, I would like to apologize. I would like to is conditional. Conditional normally has the word but after it. So if you say, I would like to apologize, 
you're avoiding the issue. If you would like to apologize, just do it. Just say, I'm sorry. I always try to explain the detail. Again, it helped. I had a captive audience. They had to listen to me. Um, some of them got really bored, I'm sure. But if we were stuck somewhere for a long time, I would always try and give them the exact reason why we couldn't continue our journey. It wasn't good enough to say level crossings failed. Why does that level crossing having failed stop us going on? People seriously think that trains can overtake each other. You know, <laughs> a broken down train to us in the industry is quite clear that it's going to cause problems. But to people sat in the train, they don't know that. If I didn't have the information, I'd always say how I was trying to get it, what I was specifically was doing as their representative. I was trying to be ahead of the questions. So with experience, you knew which questions were coming about connections and when. If you can give that information before people have to come and ask for it, that wins you a lot of points. And I always try to be available, which is where the Twitter account comes into things again. I've gone one too far there. When I was working on the trains, we've touched on the internal information systems that are available to give out really good, really clear advice. When there's disruption, I ended up spending a lot of time sat in my office on the train trying to work out what was going on and then being right next to a PA so I could make announcements. But I was shut away from all of my customers on the train. So with my Twitter account, I was able during that announcement to give out the handle for the Twitter account. And people could then send me their direct questions as if I was face to face. And I suddenly sort of gained this omnipresence along the length of a, a nine carriage train. Every single person could ask me a direct question if they wanted to. It, it does have its limitations. Not everyone has Twitter through lack of tech knowledge or deciding they don't want to be anywhere near it. It's fine. I understand. It's just another tool in the box that we can use as companies and as members of staff. I found it actually really interesting when I started having my account that the way people reacted to me was very different to how people reacted to the main account for Greater Anglia. I have a face. I'm not a brand. I'm a face. And people were so much more polite and so much more understanding of me than they were when they spoke to my colleagues on the social media desk. It also gave me a lot of pride in my job. I always had pride in my job, but it meant I had to be on my A game all the time. When you put something on Twitter, it stays there. Someone's going to have a screenshot of it. You can't afford to slip up. And I actually found that really useful. That really drove me to be as good as I could be every day. And there was a couple of times when the discreetness of Twitter is really useful. People don't want to have to get up and go and find the train manager. If there's a problem, if there's someone in the coach who's causing a problem, they don't want to be identified as that person that dobs them in. So there was a couple of occasions where I'd have these reports through on Twitter. There's, you know, there's someone in Coach E who's causing a problem. Can you come down? And I can come down. That person is completely anonymous within that coach, but I can still speak to them. And it was really useful for that on a number of occasions. So in conclusion, we, we have to keep up with the times. So the railway can be quite slow to adapt sometimes. And that makes us look a bit silly in the eyes of our customers. It took us a long time to get up to date with social media. We need to keep that going. I'd always ask companies, those of you, you know, in your company, try to trust your staff with social media. My argument that I made to Greater Anglia was that if you can trust me with the keys to a hundred mile an hour train, you can trust me with a Twitter account. But they're so scared of, of staff being on social media. I understand, but it's nothing that can't be overcome with training and thinking through the problems. In a general sense, we always need to provide as much information as we can for passengers. We need to explain the issues, even if it's after the event. And most importantly, acknowledge that different customers want different levels of information. We should try and cater for all of them. Disruption is the time when the industry can shine. I had so much more good feedback about how I handled disruption compared to how I handled normal services. The eyes are watching us when there's disruption and it's something we really have to get right. We got a lot better, but we're not quite there yet. That's just about it for me. I'll hand back to Simon. 
Thank you very much, Blake. That's fantastic stuff. Um, great to hear it from, uh, from your perspective, from the train management perspective. So uh, we'll uh, have, let's hope we have some questions for you at the Q&A. Um, if I could uh, get you to pop your microphone and camera off just for now, and then we shall hand over to the open data, what's in the toolbox side of things. So I'm uh, very happy to uh, present to you, to, uh, you with Tom, who should now have all the controls at your disposal um, to hear about real-time trains, what we could do in that space. So um, over to you, Tom. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Cairns and I run uh, what is probably best described as a little website called Real-Time Trains. Um, it's now been my job for about um, six years. Um, I primarily come from a computer science background, um, but somewhat of a passion for rail. Uh, although it does wax and wane the more, the more I work with trains. Um, this, as I say, this has been my job since leaving uni. Uh, it's uh, been around for eight years now, and it, it sort of came around from being rather unhappy with what I was being told um, when I was doing my commute to and from university. I just happened to start being grumpy at the right time when open data started to really happen in the industry. And I ended up working on what became real-time trains. And I, that really stemmed from a desire of wanting better information that I knew personally that I could trust. And if it was wrong, um, why? And then I could fix it. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot on this slide, uh, but everything here sort of falls under two distinct uh, banners. Uh, one is information delivery and one is inconsistency. Uh, I'm mostly gonna touch on the inconsistency here as I, I think that's the, the core component of, of the issues the industry faces. Um, the industry has a drive towards a common message for all of its passenger outputs um, through a concept called one version of the truth. Um, this concept is actually what caused me to build real-time trains as, as sometimes that message is wrong and that means it's inconsistent with reality and therefore it can't be the truth. It's literally just a message. Um, Having spoken to people in the industry over the years, there's a general acceptance that this is okay, uh, as, it, as they seem to think, yes, it's fine, it's wrong, but it's fine because everyone is wrong. Um, to me, that, that seems wrong, but it's roughly where we are in some cases. Um, so how does this happen? Um, there's a stark divide between the operational systems and um, like trust and passenger facing systems such as Darwin. Um, as an example of this, uh, to input, uh, full or partial cancellations into those systems it has to be done separately they don't talk to each other in that way and it has to be done by different people by different companies normally uh, now some operators are really good at this not being a problem normally um, but many people aren't and to me this just increases workload through communication required across control floors uh, just to get that message out there and it just leads to timeliness and quality being disregarded uh, the example I've got here is of the 442 picture at Woking. Now, I got on this train at Woking, um, but I saw it at Waterloo and it was showing as cancelled. I left Waterloo uh, about 15 minutes before that train was reinstated, but I did see the train crew sort of standing alongside it and I knew the train was there and I knew it had to get back to Bournemouth Depot, uh, so which is where I live. And it, it was one of those things, should I wait for it? But I, I decided just to see what was happening and sort of get on my way. And th this is all after the East ED Railman. Uh, that evening, other trains were also reinstated at very short notice with special stop orders added, um, but that wasn't represented very quickly or even at all in some cases in the system and trains were just running blind and very quiet, even though there was quite a, a demand for them. Um, so what do I think should be done as part of the industry response? Um, I, I think really it stems from we need to consider more about the passenger, which seems to be an ongoing theme today. Um, it's it's very easy to forget them and think just about the train service and how that stands. Um, and I think that goes down to the workload that control environments have to face because the industry feels like it, it plans really just for the normal and not the abnormal. Now, controls in my mind are there really to solve uh, the problems when things go wrong. And they are there while things are okay, but they're just watching, they're not intervening. And when things go wrong, uh, it's when it really goes, it, it, it's the abnormal time there. Um, to do this, I think there should be an improved consistency between operational and passenger systems. I really think that operational systems should be the lead 
as ultimately the signalers and the controllers and even just operational staff in general need to know more information than the passenger and we need to deliver that information downstream uh, from one common source and the industry have tried to do this with Darwin, but it, it doesn't deliver back well into the operational sphere. And uh, to, to go back to the sort of an inconsistency with reality, I, I genuinely think that the industry should drop one version of the truth if we can prove it wrong with data. Uh, so if we know the train is diverted or cancelled through other data that we have available, why is the industry forcing us to give a different message out? Um, and I, I've given four screenshots there, Trust, Real-Time Trains, Darwin and Tiger, and they all loosely work in different ways, but the industry wants one common message. But in severe disruption, the reality is that all four of these could give very different messages. Um, so this uh, broadly leads on to uh, what can I do as an open data developer? Um, I like to think I'm an informed passenger in the rail industry and I sort of look at this from a question of what do I do in order to know what's going on on the network when something goes wrong and I ask myself questions of what thought processes am I, am I going through in order to try and find the answer that I'm seeking um, and this is all in data um, the data that the industry has is a, is a really really powerful tool and the industry doesn't feel like, like it exploits it fully. Uh, indeed, from the operators I've spoken to over the years, uh, many don't really understand the data that they have available at their hands. Um, so over the years, um, real-time train, certainly more recently, uh, has become a useful vehicle for experimentation uh, for me and trying to answer my own personal questions, because that ultimately is what drives me to develop it. And the example I've got there is uh, a recent feature I launched with ScotRail and LNER called Know Your Train. Uh, and this is all about just providing a bit more information about rolling stock, because at the moment we just say eight coaches, 10 coaches. I, I felt that we could know, we can show the pictures of the trains and just, just give a bit more familiarity. And in disruption, this is vital, uh, just in increasing confidence. If you're at a station with lots of different types of train, uh, just knowing what your train should look like uh, it, it reduces the, the risk of is this the right train and trying to access um, staff just to confirm. It, it's really just can we be sure as to what we're doing? And one of the more recent questions I've been asking myself, um, certainly over the last few years, was um, why is my train running slowly? And this goes back to some of the other comments earlier. Um, when my train is running slowly, you're like, well, why, what happens? Um, so I've been thinking about this uh, in quite some detail and I'm launching quite soon on the Norwich to London route this feature uh, which I describe to railway people as CDAS reproposition. Now CDAS is Connected Driver Advisory System and it provides information to drivers as to what they should be doing uh, if the train's early, late and, and things like that uh, and whether they should be running sl slowly, quickly and etc. And it, this has really come from a view that passengers don't really understand birth maps and we, we need to we have this data available and we need to increase the accessibility of it. So I was trying to put this into terms that the general public can understand and provide train specific information, uh, uh, basically a real time answer as to why the train is running late, uh, slowly. And, and this helps um, fill the black hole of information when you suddenly come to a halt at a red signal and wondering, well, what's going on until about five minutes later when the guard or driver eventually says why whereas in reality we probably can work it out with data and I feel as if this levels the playing field and understanding both passengers and rail staff will have access to better information and we can certainly deliver the data that uh, we have in many different forms in a, in a better way and more directly and customized um, but as sort of a parting thing I think my message would be the industry has a lot of data at its hands and it literally does not know how best to leverage it and this is a, a path that we all need to follow in um, quite a lot of detail um, certainly now as we need to raise confidence uh, for people coming back to rail. So I'll pass back to Simon. Thank you very much, Tom. That's uh, absolutely fantastic to get an insight into uh, fantastic tools like uh, real-time trains. So we'll come back to you for the uh, for the Q and A. Um, so we're now hand over to um, to Richard Click of uh, Rail Magazine to give an, an overview um, before we get to the uh, the Q and A session. Um, so Richard, over to your good self. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak tonight, Simon. Um, 
as you probably can aware, the YRP wanted experts, wide range in search, and they've got me. So sorry about that. Um, my job is to report on all aspects of the railway. I work for Rail Magazine, we're a fortnightly publication. Uh, we cover both uh, industry and enthusiast issues. We consider ourselves the railway's best friend, and that means that we both support it, but we will criticise it when needed. Um, I've been on rail for 15 years. It's changed dramatically, not only through the job that I do, but also the industry. For example, back in 2008, I was told by a Mersey travel boss at the time that the rail industry needs to act as a customer service in the way that Marks and Spencers and, McDon and McDonald's do. At the time, I was very skeptical about that. That wasn't really the message. The whole idea of passengers being a customer uh, was still relatively new. A lot of people were against that. I've got to say, I hate the term customer, but that is where we are and we should be treated as such. And do you know, I'm not always sure that that happens. Um, we've all suffered the same experiences at some point, queues, incorrect information, lack of information, lack of information on trains, staff not being visible. Um, some of us, like Tom, I like to think of myself as an informed passenger, but some of us, for instance, my mum, they have no idea what's going on. And I think sometimes that's forgotten. Um, to give you a couple of examples, so traveling from Norwich um, late last year, there were digital announcements going on constantly, announcing that the train to London was there, the platform was empty. And this went on for about 10 to 15 minutes. You then had a human voice shouting over that. That sends a message out that the, the industry doesn't communicate, doesn't know what's going on. And for passengers who are there, you know, as a one-off trip, that's not going to bring them back. And we need to remember that we have to try to get these, certainly in COVID, post-COVID era, we need to get those passengers back. Um, information provision, for example, I think that's perhaps better than it used to be. Um, I'm a little concerned myself that we're going a bit too digital. Um, we need to remember that not everyone will instantly go to Twitter for updates. Likewise, not everyone has a smartphone. So the, we need to make sure that the announcements are correct. We need to make sure that the information we are giving to every passenger is correct. Um, but then there are some of the new innovations I think are absolutely superb. You know, I've always headed to the quiet coaches. It's normally emptier. It's got fewer reservations, and that's through years of experience. But now passenger information screens are showing where the seats are. That's fantastic. You see them at Peterborough. You see them on, on the new JA services over where I live in Norwich. I think it's fantastic. Um, we do need more of that, and that isn't about going on social media. That's a simple looking up at the screen like we've always done. You know, And again, I think when it comes to provision of information, I've travelled many times Norwich to London when Blake was the senior conductor and yeah, he, the way that he deals with passengers I think is a, a model really for how the industry should do it because he's honest and we just need more of that I think. Um, I've also had operators explain to me about the stress that their social media staff suffer as a result of the awful abuse they receive. Now, and I know from experience in my job how bad it can be, I've you know, around the time of the timetable chaos a couple of years back, abuse that we received from Northern and GTR passengers for just reporting what was going on, let alone if you are one of the poor individuals behind those Twitter accounts, the abuse that they received, and oh, that is not something I think I could deal with. But and people tend to forget that there is a human being there, and we need to we need to work on that perhaps as well. I think. Um, in the past, staff have also mentioned to me that passengers quite often have more information than they do. And I know that's something Nathaniel mentioned. Um, we need to sort that out. Surely the people in charge of the train, in charge of the stations, on the platforms, they need to have the info to be able to tell the confused passenger um, rather than, as it seems, it's the other way around. Um, I'm sure Tom will appreciate this. When I'm traveling across the UK for my job, I tend to use his website, Real Time Trains, because I trust it. The information is correct. Um, main, but I'm using that mainly as a passenger, not in my day job. Um, but I know it's accurate. And if that's if Tom can do it, then I would. There has to be 
a valid reason why Tox can't do it because otherwise, if, if Tom's got the information out there, it should be available to all. And there's another reason I use RTT that perhaps I'm not sure is being considered just yet. So we all know that some ter terminus stations across the UK are known for late announcements when it comes to which platform the train is on. You know, you could be three, four minutes until departure and then they announce the platform. As is many people follow me on Twitter know, I suffer from mental health issues like anxiety and I hate being crowded. So anything that helps people like that should always be available. You should know what platform your train is coming from, hopefully. You, and I, so what do I do? I check on Tom's website. I see where the empty train is coming or the inward working. Normal passenger doesn't know that. And we need to find ways around that as well, I believe. And the industry is, is trying, but I think we can do a lot better. But of course, the rally can do well. We're not just here to criticise it, you know. Consider delay repay. Um, yes, it can be confusing, and I've been confused by it enough times, but there are also some wonderful successes. For instance, I commute on East Midlands Railway um, from Norwich to Norwich to Peterborough. Um, you'll have probably see my frustrated tweet if you follow me. Um, however, I can now get my compensation back within minutes via PayPal if I make a claim that morning. So in recent, before COVID, in recent times, I've actually received money from the Norwich to Peterborough uh, delay, either before I've got to Peterborough bus station for the commute out to the office or by the time I've got to the office. That's brilliant. If That's something simple and it sends goodwill, I think, to passengers. And we need to, to continue getting that goodwill out there because if you look at the most recent National Rail passenger survey from Transport Focus, it shows that satisfaction with staff helpfulness is increasing, and that's good. That can only be a good thing. But there's also some more interesting reading I've found as a, as a journalist. There's a 2% decline in punctuality and reliability, and that's going to obviously influence passenger satisfaction. For example, 47% of passengers questioned are satisfied. So that means 53% are not. How can the industry work on that? Um, simple things, I would say, just telling you why your train is late. Um, being honest, really that will help. Transport Focus says it asked 4,517 people about the usefulness of information, but only 45% of those responded that they were satisfied responded that the service they received was satisfactory or good. So 55% still need to be convinced that we produce a good service. And it's all very well perhaps telling each other, but I think we need to get that message out across to the wider public because we've all seen the headlines about railways. It's very easy to kick railways. Um, when we all know we do, I say we, you guys do a fantastic job and it needs to be recognised, but we can only do that if we stop kicking ourselves in, in the teeth like we so often do. Um, and then elsewhere looking at uh, in the NRPS, um, it'll be music to Suzanne's ears, I'm sure. Long distance passengers are currently the happiest with the usefulness of, of the information. 53% of them are satisfied. Likewise, it's probably not a surprise. It's not unsurprising to know that London and southeastern passengers are the least happiest. And while there could be mitigating factors, we know commuters are hard to please. However, 63% of them need. 63% um, of them show that they're unhappy, and we need to sort that. Um, so overall, because I can see it's about. To, uh, I'm about to finish. Um, as a journalist, asking questions in my job, honesty is absolutely vital on both sides and trust. And as Blake said, be honest. As a passenger, it makes me happy and hopefully it will make other passengers happy. And at the end of the day, that's what the industry wants. Shirley, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Absolutely. Yeah, fantastic overview from yourself there. Um, so that rounds off the presentation part of the webinar. Uh, so now it's time to get the uh, panellists all up on screen. So we've all turned your mics and your cameras on. So you're all here um, and we can start the Q&A session. So um, if you haven't uh, sent your question in, then do so. Um, we'll start off with a couple of questions um, we've got here. So um, 
Um, also, if you do have a question, then please do um, just ensure that you, if it's for a particular panelist, then make sure that you uh, you flag that in your question. Um, so the first question I've got here is from Jonathan Prince, who asks, um, would it be better to have one centralised source of disruption information, such as National Rail style, or individual sources, such as LNER style, and which might be more useful to customers? Um, so which one of you wants to brave, brave that first question? Yeah, I'll go for it, Simon, if you won't. Yeah, I'm Blake. Yeah, um, yes, I think it's my personal opinion on it. Um, I would love to have a reference library. Network Rail have some bits where I can direct people to for longer term information. Um, I think there's a lot of different models coming up around the country at the moment. Suzanne spoke about LNERs. If we could take the best bits of all of those and have one unified voice, and one simple system that people know to go and give reference to, that would be brilliant. But for me, the same as most other people have said, Tom's Real Time Trains is my reference point. It doesn't necessarily work for non-industry people at the moment or not informed passengers, which I love, by the way. Um, but Tom's getting there with making it more consumable. But yes, the short answer is yes, a simple, convenient and consistent source would be brilliant. Excellent. Gonna, so, we'll go. No, sorry, go on. I think just to build on that, I, I agree. I think it's there's a lot of data out there that it's important that we find a way of mashing our way through about presenting back to that individual customer what they need to know about their individual journey because that's ultimately what's important to them. Um, and they don't need to navigate through complicated systems or anything like that. So, that's the challenge I think for the industry to be able to to convert it into something simple and meaningful. Absolutely, fantastic stuff. Um, good. Um, Tracy Barber, friend of Young Rail Professionals, hello. Um, so thank you for your question, Tracy. Um, we've got a lot of disruption due to a wide variety of reasons. Um, do any members of the panel feel that we are open enough as to the reasons for these incidents, or are we as an industry guilty of the generic instant on the line message um would more transparency with the traveling public encourage more understanding um i think i know some of the answers that that but um on transparency who wants to uh take on that one uh, i can see blake smiling <laughs> as well if you want go on nathaniel um so i agree that often generic reasoning is provided for incidents by you know on the automated announcements or on the customer there's basically the screens um on the platforms now, I'm sure part of it where operators are not giving enough detail to customers, but there's actually also a technological limitation to what what is the, the stuff that's being used at some stations, which I experienced, where there is a set number of options which can be picked for an incident, and somebody presses the button, and here presto, you've got a reason for the delay. Now it will it will. To us, when we know what the actual cause is, it will round about kind of, you know, you could fit it into that bracket. But actually, as far as I know, the, there's no way to have an automated uh, announcement, etc., which says exactly uh, what's going on at that particular incident. And that would have to be for uh, staff to intervene and uh, provide via the PA system, which I, I actively encourage because I think at times people could be much more sympathetic if they know exactly what's going on and they can de-escalate any tempers that might be rising um, if people know exactly what's going on opposed to there is an operational incident blah blah you know so yes i think we do need to work on that whether that's technologically in uh our, the that provide the announcements or whether just we need to be more open with our passengers Absolutely. Um, Can I dive so, in there? Yeah, go on, Tom, go for it. Um, so I think we do need to be more transparent. Um, however, we need to be very conscious of the issues around changing excuses. Um, as we will have one answer at one minute, so you could well have things like incidents under investigation, which I personally think for about the first 20, 30 minutes of an incident is a perfectly reasonable thing to say. Um, but as we sort of get further into the incident and we know more about what has happened, um, we, we certainly should be giving out a more honest approach and answer, but we need to be very careful to say that, yes, we've investigated it, for instance, and we've now moved on to this reason. 
And we also need to ensure in doing that, that we're not throwing out weird terminology like TCF or points failure. We need to, a points failure is quite simple, but a TCF, I mean, most of us here will understand what that is, but to the general passenger, they won't. And I, I mean, the way I describe it is it's a fault of the train detection system or something on, along those lines, which you see a few talks use now, uh, but that's where I see it. Mm. And um, um, Blake, um, you know, you've been on the front line with, with with passengers, and I'm also conscious of what Richard said about the social media kind of teams to being the, the punching bag for certain incidents. And unfortunately, when people can say some dreadful things, and then when they find out the seriousness of an incident, cause of a delay, they can change their tune. So, um, so also uh, be good to hear from Blake and Richard on on what you think on on that one. Yeah, I think um, it's very difficult in terms of railway communications to be concise when we're talking about communications between us and, and, and customers because it, it, it's it, we run a really complex business it, it's 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 complicated and unfortunately we know how complicated it is the majority of people who get on our trains think that we just put a metal box on some rails and give it a little shove and off it goes you know um, so communicating in a timely fashion the the, the issues is really tricky um, this is where I've made reference to like a reference library that we can point people off to and say, you know, if you want to find out more about a TCF, let's say it's there. Um, what I'd point to is a couple of years ago, and I was right in the thick of this, um, there was some research done, which made sense that changed the phrase we used for when someone had been hit by a train to emergency services dealing with an incident. It looked great. I looked at all the information that they used before they changed the, the phrase. But operationally on the front line, it was an absolute disaster because no one knew what it meant. When we say there's a fatality, our commuters know to go to the pub and sit for two hours, wait it out, come back and try again. And people have that empathy. So the message, the point I want to make is the message makes it a huge, huge difference. Absolutely. Thank you, Blake. And Richard, what are your thoughts? I think it's a little bit harder for me because as a journalist, I want to know everything that's going on. Um, but I also look at it. So if I know that my train is going to be delayed for a particular reason, I can then ring through to home or wherever I'm going to say I'm going to be half an hour late or the wires have come down, for instance, and you could be a while. If you just hear, oh, there's an operational incident or you get to the station and it just says delayed, um, you genuinely have no idea what's going on and within you anger will start to rise because you know you've been let down this has cost a lot of money all this stuff will, will boil up whereas if we're just told the truth you know we have the wires are down no idea how long this is going to take to fix we hope maybe within an hour or so in which case you can then make informed decisions you know can i get down to where the railway is operating by car can i cancel my, jo my job for the day it's about uh, and the wording as well, and Blake's absolutely right. If it's a fatality, tell us, because you see on social media when there's a delay, operational reasons or whatever, the abuse the LNER team get, for example, and then when they say it's a fatality, people go, oh no, sorry about that. It's too late. You've shown you you've shown yourself to be an ass. Um, whereas perhaps if the wording was different to begin with attitude to change and be different mm. so yeah a keen, a keen focus on how to get the message across to the the customer and i suppose also i'm hearing a a consistent approach as well um would be good um conscious of time um i've got a question for, for tom from peter hicks um another purveyor of excellent real-time information of a, of a slightly different kind um he asks a question which i kind of understand which is um is it possible to get data from rtts or real-time trains so an independent person can benchmark real-time trains against darwin to see which is more accurate and under what circumstances and uh do, do keep it uh, do keep it nice and uh, simple for us simple people or for me anyway um the easy answer is yes you could use the api and pull data out of it if you wanted to, um, there is a, uh, I've, to put it nicely, there is a piece of work being looked into at the moment sort of around that area to sort of benchmark all the op opportunities. Uh, and I certainly do that internally um, just to sort of benchmark the differences. Obviously, different systems have different amounts of data 
uh, being accessed. Um, so Darwin will have more train alterations. Uh, RTT doesn't uh, for various reasons. Um, so yeah, there are differences, but there, there are ways of getting access to the data to benchmark the differences. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tom. I knew you'd give a, a clear and concise answer. Um, a question for Blake from Stuart Craig. Um, and as I think it's a quick one. Have you seen a different use of the GSMR system, um, which is the Global Syst uh, Systems for Rail um, for customer information in, com in Europe compared to the UK? It's, it's used very differently. Um, we have what I describe as a closed GSMR system in this country. Um, so point of contact driver to signaler. If I didn't have any con uh, signal on my mobile phone, I could use it to ring through to control. Um, over on the continent, it's used more like a, an open chat. Um, so when we come in close to Paris, it's actually really fascinating to listen to because all of the drivers will be on there. Um, the, the French equivalent of Crossrail, et cetera, will be on there and they can give really live information. So if one of them sees a trespasser on the track, which unfortunately um, the suburbs north of Paris seems to be a, a, a regional pastime on occasion, um, they can report it live to an exact location. So there's no need for this information to bounce back up to the signaler through control and then be reattributed back down to the trains, in which point all the trains are stopped and going nowhere. That driver's reporting it live to everybody else that's around him or her, and they are reacting professionally to that situation. So yeah, it is very different. Um, it took me a long time to sort of become comfortable with it, because I'm so used to having the information filtered. Um, it has its uses. I'm, I'm not certain it's perfect how it's done over there. Thank you very much, Blake. And it's amazing to get that um, kind of outside the UK perspective as well, which is, which is great. Um, another question which pops up is from uh, uh, Robin Lapish. Um, I suppose I can maybe steer this towards um, Nathaniel, is how can we tackle some of the legacy working practices and culture that can often seem to put the operation first and the customer second? Oh, this is a meaty one, this. Um, well, actually, I've got a good one for this. Um, so GTR, a short while back, did a business case on uh, having people whose specific job was to train operational people uh, in, you know, the way they communicate and deal with customers in all situations, whether it be normal operations or daily operations. And they've actually got a team of people whose sole job is to basically move around the entire, you know, front facing business and uh, basically change perspectives because there certainly is um, amongst what you might call a traditional railway person um, the tendency to focus solely on running a train service and forget that actually without the customers there is no train service to run and um, so the as i said you know the bet the way gtr have done it is having specific people who were were basically their grade or similar equivalent um, do the same kind of jobs, who can then, on a peer-to-peer -peer almost level, although they're different, uh, different, you know, position, uh, help change perspectives and kind of show where and how uh, the way that you treat the customer really does matter and how it actually makes your job easier. Because if you're solely operationally focused, then Yes, you know, I'm sure maybe you're going to be fully dedicated to running a train service, but nobody's going to know about it because you haven't told them. So it's this kind of thing. It's getting that balance right, which I think is really important. That, that seems to ring true a lot with what Suzanne, uh, from your presentation, you, you were saying about what LNR is trying to achieve, I suppose, as well. Yeah, it absolutely does. And I think it's about empowering people and giving, the, giving them the opportunity to just solve problems at the source and understanding what they're frustrations are you know like what do they need what do you need you, you need real-time communications you need what else sorry that's my doorbell <laughs> um Take away here. Uh, yeah. so just just different you know what what is what is what is needed to help turn around that customer experience and by understanding that and letting people get on with that and just taking away a lot of the kind of maybe there was red tape or 
things that they hoops they jump to, you know, get rid of all of that and, and keep reinforcing the message and, and that education comes consistently. You know, this isn't something we dip in and out of. This is a consistent kind of focus for us and has been for a couple of years now. Thank you very much. I'm really conscious of time, everyone. So um, I think we're going to wrap up the Q&A there and let everyone get on with, with their evenings and with their dinners. Um, questions keep pouring in, um, which has been great, great, great response and a great uh, attendance tonight. So um, you're, you're very popular, everyone, uh, which is great. So I'm sure they'd want to have you all night answering questions, but um, we'll make a wrap um, there. So I've popped the next slide up for everyone to uh, just as a, a recap um on on uh, yrp uh, but um, before i do that i'm going to say thank you so much to this fantastic panel who've agreed to spend um some time out of their evenings and preparing um for this presentation on an, an, in an interesting topic um which is something that will be obviously relevant now but also very much so when we start getting people back on the railway which we must do uh if we want to hit our sustainability targets and uh, must be prepared for people to be back on trains and, and looking after them in the most safe way possible depending on the situation going forward um so we thank you all for all your hard work and for everything that you've done for uh, yrp this evening um so um we've got some future events i've popped up on the screen there for you um so next week this time next week we've got the digital innovation and customer experience event so sign up for that on our website and the final part of our four-part series to my former self with some um, fantastic speakers from Siemens giving their career insights and that is on Wednesday next week not tomorrow but the week next week at 5 30. Um, so for young rail professionals register on our website sign up you'll get notifications for events you'll get to go on the social link where you can connect with other young rail professionals and um, that's www.youngrailpro.com follow us on Twitter at young rail pro we've got LinkedIn as well and if you follow the link there you'll see that all our previous webinars that we We've been running under lockdown have gone on there this one will be on there as well which has been recorded um so we'll have a record of this one as well and all future ones will be put on there as well so we've got that resource um so thank you very much everyone for attending um thank you to the panel thank you to my yrp colleagues who supported on this as well and we hope you stay well and um, keep the railway running stay safe and well everyone and thank you very much good evening <laughs>